well, how many words does the average person speak in a day? Now, some of you are probably saying to yourselves, this is a trick question. Do I think about how many words a day women speak? How many words a day men speak? And then average them? Do I have to figure out the percentages of the population, so on and so forth? Uh, There's a couple of bumper stickers that I've seen recently that I appreciate. One says, uh, shut up and drive. The other one says, hang up and drive. I think we really have increased the number of words we speak uh, in a day with uh, cell phones and everything. Uh, It's uh, just so common to uh, see people uh, driving along and uh, speaking on their cell phones. And of course, you you don't have to see them on the cell phone. You can tell by the way they're driving, can't you? They stay a little longer at that uh, green light before they take off. They're often uh, swerving a little bit, uh, sometimes reaching for things, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, hang up and just drive. Well, the average uh, for uh, women in a day is, they say, about 30,000 words. What do you think the average is for a man? Would you say uh, the same, half that, uh, a third of that? Uh, Probably somewhere, they say, between 12 to 15,000 words a day for men. Now, I must say, looking at the fine print of the uh, study, they did not include, in the words of men, grunts and muttering and moans. So probably if you included those, it might be up around 20,000 or so. For we have a tendency to mutter to ourselves more. 30,000 words a day. How do you speak them and not get into trouble? Well, in our study of going through themes in the book of Proverbs, uh, today I've chosen uh, words from Proverbs about the tongue, the power of of the tongue. And if you'd like to follow along in the bulletin is a little insert that has uh, an outline about the uh, power of the tongue. And one of the first things that Solomon says to us from the book of Proverbs is that we should think before we speak. We should think before we speak. Well, how many times uh, have we heard uh, that stated? Proverbs 15, 28 says this, The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. Interesting, the word ponders is used, um, in the animal kingdom it's used for animal noises, but in the human realm it's used for kind of muttering to oneself. Just kind of uh, muttering to yourself, what should I say? The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things or calamities. We really need to ponder or think about things before we respond. Proverbs 21, 23 says this, He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. How many high-profile uh, commentators or sports announcers or others uh, have we seen over the years lose their jobs and their careers over an unguarded and uh, thoughtless comment? The one who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. Uh, Proverbs twenty nine twenty says this, Do you see a man who is hasty in his words, there is more hope for a fool than for him. If we just blurt out and and speak so quickly and respond so quickly, well, we're going to find ourselves in uh, great trouble and great difficulty. So often we want to respond back so quickly. We want to come back with a quick comment or whatever, and often 
without thinking we say very hurtful things. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it, love life, will eat its fruit. Yes, uh, death and life are in the power of tongue. And uh, we can determine the quality of life very often with the quality of our words and how we respond. Proverbs 18.13 says, He who gives an answer before he hears, it is a folly and a shame to him. How often in a conversation or when we are, uh, uh, somebody is speaking to us, are we thinking about how to respond? and what to say back. And often, we want to break in to the conversation and begin to say something before we have heard the whole story. I recommend waiting until you hear the whole story because if you break in to it, the person might be smart enough to just change the ending of the story on you before they make their conclusion. He who gives an answer before he hears it is a folly and a shame to him. Proverbs 15, 23 says, A man has joy in an appropriate answer, and how delightful is a timely word. Yes, our answer should be thoughtful. We should mutter or ponder over it. And uh, if we can speak that word in a timely way, and usually a timely way means that the other person has completed their thoughts or their statements. Then they might be ready to listen. Proverbs, 20, or Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety in a man's heart can weigh him down, but a good word makes it glad. Yes, uh, there are times when we just need to listen for a while, listen to somebody speak about what's on their heart, what's troubling them, and then when they have had a chance to share their thoughts, then to prayerfully think about what would be a good word that might encourage and make that person glad. I'm, uh, I'm thankful. I can think about times in my life when uh, maybe I was under great uh, stress or difficulty and uh, a good friend would come along and uh, the good friend would listen for a while and then the good friend would share a word of encouragement from the scriptures, uh, a word of blessing, a promise of God. And that timely answer, that good answer, was enough to uh, lift the spirits and to give one hope. Yes, we should think, ponder, even pray before we respond and speak back. The second principle is we should make sure that we Speak the truth at all times. Uh, false comfort or false words are but a false report, and it will uh, be no value. Proverbs twelve nineteen: Truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. Yes, as you know, when we lie, we always have to back it up with what? Another lie. And then you've got to back that up with a another lie, and ultimately you got to back it up with a great memory, <laughs> you know, because uh, you got to remember that twisted tale that you have created. Truthful lips. I, I think everyone uh, respects truth uh, over the long run. It, even if it's truth that says, you know what, I blew it. Uh, yeah, I didn't get that done. Or yes, uh, you know, I made that mistake. Of course, I wouldn't want to be that uh, Michigan State coach uh, uh, today who blew that uh, uh, field goal kicking uh, incident. Oh, my, my. <laughs> but there's no truthful response is all that can be given. Proverbs 16, 13, righteous lips are the delight of kings, and he who speaks right is loved. Now, we don't uh, speak so much to kings anymore. But uh, sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we tell our boss, we tell our parents, we tell our peers, we tell our friends, 
what they want to hear, not what is really truthful. Yeah, it's the easy way out for now, you know. But if you're uh, a king or if you're a person, you really need to hear what is true, what is righteous. Righteous lips are the delight of a king's. Over the long run, uh, we need to tell people what is right, what is true, what is proper. If we only tell them what they want to hear, all it does is it creates uh, that proverbial snowball, which we will be experiencing in a few months, rolling down the hill and getting bigger and bigger and uncontrollable. If you really uh, respect yourself and you want to show respect to others, you'll not tell them what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and he who speaks right is loved. I I think that over the long term, uh, people really do prefer to hear the truth, to know what is really uh, going on. Otherwise, all we're doing is hiding problems, unresolved difficulties, and the result, of course, of that will be only greater problems. And then, of course, your boss or your friend says, well, why didn't you tell me that in the beginning? Well, our answer is usually, well, I didn't think you wanted to hear it. I didn't think you'd listen to it. Well, what does it do? It only complicates the problems. Proverbs 21.6 says this, the acquisition of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and the pursuit of death. You know, we, we, if, if we use lies to gain financial benefit and uh, things like that, it will come back and it will uh, haunt us. It will cause problems. Uh, if you're in sales or something like that, I know you have great uh, ethical difficulties at times, don't you? I mean, I think that there are probably honest used car salespeople out there, uh, but wouldn't, isn't that a challenging kind of business uh, to be in? Or any kind of, of uh, uh, situation where you are um, marketing or sales or advertising and those kinds of things. We need to be as truthful and uh, honest as we can be in all of our dealings. Uh, That's one of the reasons why I never, uh, like, sell one of my cars. By the time I'm done with them, they're not even good enough for Mother Waddles, you know? I mean, I'd hate to sell a car to somebody because I know by the time I'm done with it, it's like, you know, there is no buyer beware. It's it's beware, (laughs) you know? (laughs) This thing's no good anymore. And uh, how difficult it is. Uh, We just, acquisition of treasures. So very often, people find themselves manipulating the truth or giving false promises or whatever in order to acquire. And uh, Solomon says, you know what? It's going to flee away like a vapor. Proverbs 4.24 says, Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. Yes, We need to speak the truth as honestly and accurately and openly as we can. The third principle is we should speak so that people can listen. Uh, Many times uh, I remember as an apprentice plumber or in other situations, I would say to my foreman or to my uh, journeyman, you are speaking so loud I cannot hear you screaming and yelling and the vulgarities that just come along with the culture of that trade. You know, it's just, sometimes it's just so loud you say, I just can't hear you. I'm, I'm shutting down. I know this is a challenge sometimes for parents that we feel, I have felt, I have experienced this, uh, I have exercised this, where I think if I raise the volume, somehow I'm going to get through like uh, that, you know, blockhead or whatever, and uh, that, that I will be heard better. Well, we need to speak so that people can listen. Proverbs twenty five fifteen says this, By forbearance or by patience, a ruler may be persuaded, 
And a soft tongue breaks the bone. A soft tongue breaks the bone. Uh, we need in our communication, when we're responding back to people, we need to be patient. We need to be laid back. Uh, we need to sometimes speak softer. Because if, if I raise my level of communication, then they raise their level of communication, and pretty soon we're, we're way up here when we really need to just try to soften uh, the answer. Uh, when you're trying to persuade a ruler, if you're patient, or, or to persuade somebody, if you're patient in uh, making your argument, in making your point. I find it interesting in the Roberts Rules of Order, uh, which is based upon a lot of you know, study of, of the polity of meetings and communication and so on and so forth, they set a limit of three times a person can speak. Actually, it's two times they can make their point. A third time is a rare exception, and then that's it. Because chances are, if somebody hasn't heard you by the third time, they're not going to hear you. I know we sometimes like to keep making our point and making our point, but patience, patience, and softness of answer, and we may be able to persuade the ruler. A soft tongue breaks the bone. A soft tongue breaks the bone is a very odd figure of speech. And as much as I researched this and looked into this, I could not find a good explanation of that. There's many other ancient Near Eastern um, uh, figures of speech that are very like this, like a, a soft answer can uh, break the metal. Uh, it's, it's kind of like dripping water. You know, water that drips and drips and drips will ultimately bore a hole through the object that it is hitting. And so in our communication, uh, we need to respond in such a way with softness that over a period of time, we might be able to really uh, communicate to the person and persuade them. Uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verses 2 through 4 say this, The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable. A wise person will think about, all right, how can I say this in such a way that the person will be able to hear me? How can I, what words can I use? What tone can I use? What illustration can I use? In, in such a way as to make this something that they can really accept or listen to. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools simply spouts folly. Verse 13, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil or the calamity and the good. Verse 4, but a soothing, a healing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the tongue. Yeah, we, we need to try to pick the right words, the right way to say it. Uh, a soothing tongue or a healing tongue is usually one that puts forth a solution rather than blame. You know, if we get into the blame game, we will do nothing but alienate each other. But in our communication, we ought to say to ourselves, all right, what solution can I put on the table? What option can I put on the table that will resolve this ultimately? Yes, we should l speak in such a way that people will be able to listen. Another point that Solomon makes about the tongue is that we should avoid flattery when we speak. Uh, we should, flattery is what? Flattery is sometimes what? False compliments, uh, insincere uh, statements. Uh, flattery is usually words that have the purpose of manipulating the other person. And I don't think anybody really likes to be manipulated. Proverbs 26, 24 says this, He who hates disguises it with his lips, but he lays up deceit in his heart. When he speaks graciously, do not believe him. For there are seven abominations in his heart, Though his hatred covers itself with guile, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. 
He who digs a pit will fall in it. He who rolls a stone, it will come back on him. A lying tongue hates those it crushes, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Yes, we should avoid flattery and be careful that we are not drawn in by insincere or manipulative flattery. Proverbs 29.5, a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. Proverbs 28.23, he who rebukes a man will afterwards find more favor than he who flatters with the tongue. This goes back to the idea of telling people the truth. To tell people what they want to hear, to flatter them, to manipulate them, is only going to come back and hurt you. It is better to rebuke or correct a person because ultimately they will, I think, come back and you will find more favor with them. To, um, to uh, save a person an embarrassing moment, to privately you know, instruct them or correct them or suggest something to them and uh, keep them from making uh, an incorrect step if you do that properly over time, that kind of trust will uh, bring favor to you and to the other. Proverbs 27, 2. Let another praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. Uh, when I was growing up, we had the little phrase, don't toot your own horn, right? And uh, when it comes to flattery, there are people that just love to talk about themselves uh, they love to tell us about how wonderful and great and they, uh, special they are. Um, but this gets old fairly quickly. Uh, let another praise you, not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. Proverbs thirty thirty two. If you have been foolish in exalting yourself, or you, if you have plotted evil, put your mouth, put your hand over your mouth, Solomon says. Uh, we need to be careful about uh, kind of uh, bragging and talking and, and those kinds of things where we exalt ourselves. Uh, we should avoid uh, flattery of others and flattery of ourselves. Chances are, most of the time, it really isn't true. The next thing, we should not gossip when we speak. What is gossip? I think gossip is talking about people or issues or things when the people who are in the communication process are not part of the solution. You know, if, I, if I'm not part of a solution, then I don't really care to pass on the information usually. Uh, gossip is when we like to, you know, have something that other people don't know. We want to kind of be the insider. You know how it works in Washington. If they really want to get some information out, what do they do? Hold a big press conference? No, they leak it, don't they? They leak it because the press loves the scoop. They love, you know, that uh, um, thing that only they know and then to get out and to broadcast it. And they broadcast that leak. Well, when it comes to gossip, we need to be very careful. If we are not part of the solution, if we're not part of solving that problem, then do we really need to pass on the innuendo or the information? Proverbs 20, verse 19. He who uh, goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip. Uh, kind of a more earthy uh, illustration of this was some years ago, uh, Tim LaHaye's grandmother, um, Tim LaHaye of the Left Behind series, uh, told us that uh, if a dog brings you a bone, he'll bring other people a bone. We thought, what are you talking about? You know, And then she illustrated it in the relationship to gossip. And uh, we should not associate with people who gossip, because understand this, if they're going to gossip about somebody else and bring you a bone, well, then they're going to gossip about you and give somebody else a bone. He who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip. 
I know that this is very difficult sometimes in the corporate America or in the marketplace or in the office or, or even in the neighborhood. There are people who love to just go around and talk and talk about the neighbors or the politics of the office or, the, or whatever. And doesn't it get old and doesn't it get draining and uh, doesn't it get so distorted? Uh, we need to avoid people like that. Uh, many times uh, in my life I've said to somebody, you know, I don't really want to know that. Or when they'll come to me, they'll, I'll say, am I part of the solution? Is there something I can do to help solve this problem? Is that why you're coming to me? Um, a lot of times that turns them off. Well, if that turns them off, then that's what's necessary. Proverbs 16.27 says this, A worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. A perverse man spreads strife, and a slanderer or gossiper separates intimate friends. It is so unfortunate that gossip at times can separate the best of friends. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9, He who conceals a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. Sometimes when we hear something, or we see something, the best thing to do is really to conceal it, to not tell anybody else about it. If you need to, you can go to that person privately. You can go to them individually, and you can talk to them. Maybe then you'll understand the whole story. I'm reminded of the proverb that says, uh, the argument of a person sounds good until you hear the other side. <laughs> And you hear both sides. And uh, we ought to uh, cover things up with love uh, when necessary. Proverbs 19, 28. The New American Standard says, A rascally witness. I don't know what a rascally witness is. I think of maybe the little rascals when I hear that word. But the word could be better translated maybe corrupt or a person, a witness with ulterior motives. A person with ulterior motives, a witness, makes a mockery of justice, and the mouth of the wicked spreads iniquity. Oh, this is particularly so true in our political uh, realm, isn't it, these days? I'm not looking forward to 2008. It's already started, hasn't it? Everybody's jockeying and positioning. I mean, the presidential election was not even over, and they were speculating as to who's going in 2008, starting to politically posture themselves, and uh, they are, there is all of this corruption and, and people with ulterior motives, and of course, that's just not in the politics of our U.S. government. I know for you folks, a lot of you, it's in the politics at work, in the politics of, of uh, you know, the... Uh, corporate America or the factories or your offices. And that's, that's so unfortunate. And a, a, a corrupt witness makes a mockery of true justice. And the mouth of the wicked spreads iniquity. Proverbs 25, 23. The north wind brings forth rain. Now, in the ancient Near East, in the land of Israel, all of the rain comes from the north. It comes from the northwest. And uh, generally speaking, particularly in the winter months, it is a cold rain. It is a drenching kind of rain. And, of course, for ancient Near Eastern peoples, uh, that was just very, very uh, miserable and very uncomfortable. Uh, when we were living in Dallas, uh, we could go from a beautiful uh, morning of 70, 75 degrees and all of a sudden, they would have what they called a blue northerner come down with the coldest of rain and the humidity, and you'd be down in the 40s all of a sudden, and it could last for a week on end, and it was just absolutely miserable. Solomon says, like the north wind that brings the rain, so a backbiting tongue and an angry countenance brings its uh, displeasure, brings its suffering. And we need to be careful in our communication that we're not gossiping, that we're not backbiting, that we're not 
spewing forth uh, anger. Uh, lastly, Solomon says, uh, in the power of the tongue in our communication, we should let our words be few. Proverbs 13.3 says, The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips will come to ruin. Yes, uh, we need to guard our mouth. We need to guard how much we talk and how much we say uh, to other people. Not just what we say, but how much we say. Proverbs 15.2 says, The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools just spouts forth folly. Proverbs 10.8, the wise of heart will receive commands, but a babbling fool will be ruined. When we just babble on and on and on and talk and talk and talk, we're going to find ourselves getting into difficulty. Proverbs 10.19 says, where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, unavoidable. But the one who restrains his lips is wise. Uh, there are times in life when we have to do what? We have the figure of speech, you've got to bite your tongue, or bite your lip. And there are times when it's wise to just say, you know what? They're not listening. I'm not getting through. I'm, you know, to say this, the umpteenth time is it's just not going to work, you know? And uh, it's time to just bite our tongue or bite our lip and to uh, come back another time. Proverbs 18.2, A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his or her own mind. Uh, a foolish person, doesn't really want to understand. Uh, they just want to spout off. They just want to speak and talk and talk and uh, reveal their own mind. And uh, we should let our words be few. Uh, when we have few words, very often a person or people will listen more intently. Uh, over the years of different meetings that I've been in, like in higher education, so on and so forth, I've noticed some people who could sit through an entire meeting and uh, not say very much. And then when they did speak, everybody would then listen. Uh, that's one of the things I think I admire about uh, our Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. They always say, you know, he doesn't say a lot. He doesn't speak a lot. And that's his style. I think it's a wise style. Because when he does speak, it seems that the people then are willing to listen. And uh, what we want is we want those opportune times when somebody is really going to listen. So we need to choose our words carefully and we need to choose the right ones. In the New Testament, in the book of James, James, you remember, who was the uh, half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, James and his writings reflect a lot of the sayings of Jesus, and his writings reflect much of the wisdom of Solomon. Turn with me, if you will, to James chapter 3 and verse 5 and following. James chapter 3 and verse 5. James says this, So also the tongue is a small part of the body, really weighing only a few ounces, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set on flame by such a small fire, Verse 6 of chapter 3, And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. 
Verse 7, for every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. I mean, that's what keeps sea world and marine land and crocodile Dundee and all these other places in business, doesn't it? That we've been able to tame them. Verse 8, though, it says, but no one, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Now, I think the analogy of James is this. As God has given man creative order and authority over the animal kingdom to tame it, so man must have someone in authority over them to tame their tongue. Just as man can control the animal kingdom by God's designated authority out of creation, uh, so, if we are going to control our tongue, we need our Creator to help us. Verse 9, with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who are made in the likeness of God. For, from the same mouth come both blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does the fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? The answer is obviously no. Nor can salt water produce fresh water. Uh, the only way that we can produce godly speech is if we have submitted ourselves to God's control. I continue to be offended uh, by the language <laughs> of people today. Again, if I go to a sporting event, I can't believe the language. If I'm even, you know, it, it just how much cursing and cussing and everything has become a part of our culture today. And that is just unacceptable for a believer in Jesus Christ. I understand that people think that in some way they are making a greater point or expressing themselves or communicating more effectively. But for us as believers in Jesus Christ, it's just unacceptable. We need to maintain our godliness uh, in the midst of our workplace, our neighborhoods, and uh, all of our uh, walks of life. A fountain should bring forth blessings to God, not cursings and judgments upon humanity. We should let our words be few. We should be thoughtful and ponderous about what we speak. Speaking the truth, avoiding flattery, and avoiding gossip. And uh, as James says, we will be able to direct the course of life as we control our speech. Let's pray. As Bruce comes to